Okay, let's get started. Um, today, uh, essentially, we're going to kick off la um, um, lab six, um, histogramming. So this is going to be our next uh, programming pattern we're going to we're going to talk about. Yeah, again, just putting things into context. We were talking about the big, easy, heavy compute, highly parallel matrix multiply, convolution. Then we moved to the more irregular patterns like reduction, scan. And today we're going to introduce another variation on reduction called the histogram. Uh, we might think of it as a parallel online reduction, parallel and online, as opposed to the reduction that we did the first time around. We'll get to that. Okay, but it's another very common pattern, uh, one that I have uh, some good experience with uh, that tends to be something that's left over when we parallelize all the easy stuff. Okay, now as a precursor getting into histogramming, uh, we're going to introduce, maybe develop further this idea of atomic operations. Okay, that's today's lecture. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, I don't anticipate very this pretty com this is not a complex topic by any means um, but let's go through it before we go there any questions comments feedback things going smoothly lab wise project wise this yeah. is uh, the lab that's due this week is lab 5.2 right 5.2 this week um I think there's a one or two week gap before lab six is due. And then somewhere in the middle, uh, project milestone two is due. Okay, project milestone three, uh, I think we'll make available to you next week. And as a preview of project milestone three, what you're gonna be doing is, we're gonna give you a list of like 2015-ish optimizations you can perform. Some of them are easy, some of them are challenging, some of them might work, some of them might not work. But you essentially have to implement 10 points worth of those optimizations. Okay, each optimization, the simple ones might be worth a point or two. The more complex ones, five points. Your job is to implement them, yes. No, no, I mean, implementing them is the, is the thing. They may work, they may not work. You don't know that, right? So we're not going to penalize you for doing something that ultimately doesn't work. And if it does hurt performance, can we then roll it back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. You can implement them serially if that's what you're getting at. Uh, all the details will be provided when we write it up. Uh, I think we're also going to do a leaderboard just to make it a little more in interesting and challenging. Yeah, let's see what the top performing code in the class is. And we'll do a leaderboard style um, thing there as well. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Okay, good. Let's talk about um, atomic operations and histogramming then. Okay. Common problem, we've talked about this one, but kind of let's approach it carefully, slowly, and let's build it up. Okay, so let's say we in have a real life situation where you and whoever else in the world is trying to buy a, a, a plane ticket. And as you're buying the plane ticket, what you're doing is you're reserving a seat on the plane. Okay, now when you're doing this, yeah, okay, I see the seat, it's empty, I'm gonna go reserve it, click, 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 pay, click, done. But while that's happening, how do we ensure that, okay, some other person didn't also, while I'm clicking through, entering my credit card information, come through and also reserve the same seat? 
true for our website. It's also true for a lot of other things, not just digital things, right? That we have to ensure that that seat from the point I reserve it to the point I buy it, or maybe I don't buy it. You know, there's a timeout, sure, but maybe I'm just holding on to the seat for an hour. Everything has to accommodate, okay? In real life, in the digital world, and when we bring it down to the coding world, things get really interesting and complex. And that's really the particular pattern we're trying to deal with here, okay? It's not just true for CUDA. It's not just true for parallel systems. It's true for multi, uh, multi-programmed workloads, okay? I'll explain all this as we go through. So ultimately, uh, let me boil it down to something. I'm gonna insert a blank page here. Okay. And let's just say that I've got some um, uh, thread, and that thread is incrementing x, where x is a global meaning it's visible by all threads. Okay, so we have a situation here where Okay, I've got a bunch of threads. In fact, some of them are executing in a warp. So they're all doing this x equal x plus one. Right, we've talked about this, but let's approach it carefully now. Okay, so what happens? Well, those instructions x equal x plus one, to be very clear, ultimately get converted or compiled into a sequence of instructions that is load x into some register, let's say r1, Okay, we, we convert x equal x plus one into a set of three instructions. Now, even on a CUDA system, yeah, it's three instructions. On a CPU microcontroller, almost all types of architectures, it's gonna get converted into a set of instructions that amount to a load from memory and add to that value and a store back to memory. Now, some architectures might convert this into two, some architectures might convert it into one, but the operations are universal. Load, add, store. Okay? So those are the three basic primitive operations that we end up performing. And therein lies the issue. Let's divide it. Okay, so now what we just said is we've got these threads, thread one, thread two, thread three, all the way to thread n, essentially executing that set of instructions. I've written them differently on the slide here. But it's essentially the load, the add, and then the store. Now if the threads are in the same warp, we know that they're actually gonna be doing those operations together. But if they're not in the same warp, they're executing in an arbitrary order. Okay, so let's talk about the situation for the moment where they're not in the same warp. Okay, so if they're not in the same warp, we run into a situation where the ordering, we don't know what the ordering is. 
and therefore we cannot determine what the actual value will be when we do the store. So for example, let's look at one particular ordering. This is a good ordering, by the way. So maybe thread one executes those three instructions at time one, two, three. Thread two executes those instructions at time four, five, six. And if we kind of step through the sequence, what we see is, okay, if mem x starts off with the value zero, then this instruction here will load a zero. We'll add one to it, and we will store it back in memx. Instruction four, or the, the, at time four, thread two will execute an instruction to load the one, add one to it, now it's a two, and we store that two into memx, which is good. Two threads, we've incremented that variable x as we would expect. So this is a good sequence. Well, that's, but clearly there's more subtlety here and we could have timing scenario two just as well. We walk through this and yeah, at the end of it, mem x has a two and we're still fine even though the ordering was very different. Well, now here's where the complicated scenarios arise. But what if the two happen to be not, not completely disjoint, but there's some overlap? Well, now here's where things can go a little astray. So again, let's assume memx has a zero to start with, So we execute at time one this instruction. Now old has the value zero. We increment it. But now thread two sneaks in. Okay. And does a load, the, the, the first instruction of its sequence at time three. It loads the original value of memx, which is still zero. And then thread one does the store. Thread two does the update or, or the increment. Thread two does the update. And we end up with a one in memx. It's not what we wanted because we had two threads execute the code. x equal x plus one. And clearly that's not the right output we want, right? And you can kind of walk through these and convince yourself that, yeah, there's a variety of these scenarios. And although it may appear that, well, this could be rare, it can occur. In fact, it's not rare and does occur. So what do we do? Question. Uh, uh, sync threads can solve this problem, but you'll find out it's tricky. Okay. In fact, we need something a little more malleable than sync threads. Sync threads is like using um, a blunt force tool to do a surgery. Yeah, you could probably do it and maybe even succeed, but you don't really want to do that. Uh, let's take the question there. Yeah, so we're gonna make it simple and we're gonna say these are two threads from different warps. Same block, different warps, okay. But hey, let's take your question. What happens if they're from the same warp? Then what happens? Let's be careful. It's, that is a question that has subtlety. How would that work? Yeah, are you going to answer the question or do you have a different question? Uh, I'll answer the question. Okay. First. So um, when they're in the same war, they're guaranteed that there's only one scenario?
every assembly stuff can happen at one step. Okay, so yes, let's start there. So what he is saying, I, I won't draw this, but just imagine it, right? I've got thread one and thread two, same warp. So really, at time one, I have two loads. Well, what does that mean, two loads? How will that work, two loads? I can do two loads, right? In fact, let's simplify it. If I were doing load from X and load from Y, how would that work? Yeah? Good. What he's saying, and very nicely, is he's saying that, well, it really depends on how the memory system will respond to two loads. Maybe it will take those two loads and say, okay, they actually belong to the same burst. Right? X is here and Y is here, so I'm going to get X and I'll get Y for free. So here you go, load one. Here you go, load two. Nice. Maybe the memory system is not so well de designed. Maybe the memory system will say, oh, two loads. Okay, load one first, then load two. Again, this is not an architectural thing. It's a implementational thing as to how the memory will respond. It could do load two first and then load one. It's up to the memory. Yes? So does that mean, regardless of implementation of how the memory then, like, can you, this might be, like, wrong. Is there an implied string thread between each assembly instruction? And yes, yeah, yes, you can think of it that way, that all threads are implicitly synchronized. Okay, meaning we can't execute the add until the loads are done. Okay, no thread can... <laughs> Zoom ahead of all the other threads in the same warp. Yeah, implied sync threads. Exactly. Okay. So, my point is, again, coming back to our conceptual thread one and thread two in the same warp, time one, they both execute the load. Yeah, maybe one load happens before the other load, or maybe they happen at the same point in time, same cycle, or maybe... It's the other way. It doesn't, we don't know. All we know is those loads are going to finish before the ads start. In fact, what do we know? That they'll both go to zero in this scenario. Right? We, are, we know that. Or they'll all both load a one or a, they'll load the same value. Time step two, what happens? And let's think through the details. Time step one was the load. Time step two is what? The operation. Any issues there? No. no, that's what the CUDA environment was built for. Parallel operations. Great, they're all doing the, 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 the ad. By the way, uh, let, let, let's again, as we're filling in detail here, let's think this through. I call it time step one and I call it time step two. Do I mean cycle? Why not? Why don't I mean cycle? Yes, 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 yes. Let me throw in a little bit of a story here. Uh, and, and you're totally right. Time steps and cycles are two different time scales. Okay. And we have to think about the difference because it matters. Um, so let me give you a little story. I, I, I was working with Intel in a 2001 to 2002 time frame. And we were working on a particular problem where things were just messy. Uh, and we were thinking down at the cycle granularity on a particular issue that we were trying to confront when one of the engineers on the project 
who is a senior distinguished architect, long, illustrious career at Intel, made a comment that just kind of brought so much clarity to the situation. And, you know, we were thinking about time in a particular way. Like, wow, that's a tiny amount of time, and so much is happening in that amount of time. And he said, well, and by the way, he's a physicist, so he's thinking abstractly to begin with. He said something that was so profound, which was, imagine, and we were thinking about the clock cycle, which was, you know, at the time, 100 picoseconds. And we're thinking, wow, how is all that happening in that amount of time? His perspective was, think about the clock cycle as stretching across the room. And now we're just managing events as they're happening in that clock cycle. And that simple statement, although it may seem kind of trite to you and obvious to you, just phew, brought so much clarity to us. And yeah, we figured it out. I want you to do the same thing. Right? This time step here, load, thread one load, thread two load. If you're a student of computer engineering, you need to be able to expand that out and understand all the pieces that are happening in that one time step. It's not one clock cycle. It's hundreds, potentially, of clock cycles, starting with the execution of the load somewhere deep in the guts of the SM. Right? In fact, we have 16 or 32 loads happening at that point in time. And they all trigger some activity. And that activity is essentially sending memory requests up to the memory controller, the boundary of the pin uh, of the chip that interfaces to the memory. How it gets there, again, those are all details that we can fill in. And then once those memory requests reach the boundary of the chip, hundreds of time steps later, it triggers a bunch of activity to the DRAM. Hopefully, just one, right? Hopefully, just one load, as opposed to 32 loads coming from that warp. The memory responds. The data percolates back. And eventually, ideally, at the same time, but depends on the implementation, could come at multiple times, those threads receive their data which is all the same. Okay, and at that point, okay, now we do time step two, which is the add. And again, we can think about it as multiple cycles, or one cycle, probably, um, that the adds execute. And then, finally, they do all through the store. So what happens there on the store? writing the same value to the same space in memory. So we have 16, 32, th I, I say 16, by the way, when I talk about warp, because on most GPUs, I've been telling you 32, thread, warp size is 32, which is right. But most GPUs actually execute the warp over two cycles. Okay, so... 16, 16, so 16 stores on one clock cycle are now hitting towards the memory system. And then 16 more in the next clock cycle. They're all the same address. They're all the same value. What do you think the, the memory system will do? We don't know. We would hope that it does one store. Maybe not. Okay, makes sense. Hopefully that breakdown was helpful to you. Any questions? Okay, good. So let's come back to the multi-warp um, scenario where the threads are actually executing across time. We don't know when thread two executes, 
relative to thread one. But in order for this particular pattern to work, we need to make sure there's no overlap between what thread two and what thread one are trying to do. Right? These are the these are the two good scenarios that work for what we're trying to accomplish. So what we need is a way to guarantee that these are the timings. And we just went through this exercise where, boy, the hardware, unless we tell it something otherwise, can execute those loads and those stores however it wants. So we need to ensure that the hardware does this and only this. Okay? And we can do that, in fact. Um, every architecture from the days of multi-programmed workloads has had to implement something to deal with this. Okay? So even if you have one processor, you still need to do this. And if you want to know why, we can talk after class. I just don't want to go into that digression for the moment. Okay. Clearly, if you have multiple processors or you have multiple threads executing, we need to make sure the threads don't um, have a poor ordering around these kinds of uh, uh, operations. So we need to introduce the idea of an atomic operation. What an atomic operation is, it, it is essentially x equal x plus 1 or x equal x plus something constant that's executed in an uninterruptible fashion. Okay. It's very easy. Okay. So let, let me just read through this and then we'll go into some detail. Okay. So we need a single instruction that a single instruction uh, that goes to some address. It reads the old value, calculates a new one, and writes that value to the location. Okay, so a single instruction to do that. And furthermore, this is part two, no other thread can access that location until the operation is complete. That's called an atomic operation. And, and again, let me just repeat, every architecture, be it CUDA or x86 or ARM or RISC-V or you know, the code, whatever runs the code in your toothbrush, yeah, you gotta have this. It's just as important as an ad. Okay, so in CUDA, coming down to it, very simple for us to use an atomic ad. Just use the atomic ad API, where we provide an address. In this case, it's an integer, and we provide a value by which we want to increment that uh, address. So if I'm trying to do x equal x plus 1, it's atomic add address of x comma 1. Okay? And what the hardware will ensure is that we never end up in situations like timing scenario four or timing scenario three, and that only timing scenario one and two are the ones that are permissible. Okay, so there we go, atomic add. And furthermore, a bunch of variations of it, uh, if I want to do, um, 64-bit integers or a single precision floating point, uh, those variations are all there. Okay. X86 
sense? Pretty simple, right? How do we implement an atomic ad? Here we go. Let's talk about two threads, different warp. What is an atomic ad? What, what, what must it do? So single instruction. Yeah, we got to do a load at store. So it really turns into three more primitive operations. So load goes out. What happens? Again, think about it as code. If you had to implement this in code, how would you do it? Let's put some more detail around that. Okay, so I, here is a special load coming into the memory system, the, the, you know, the, the memory controller. It's a load that's associated with an atomic operation. We can designate it that way because, yeah, we, we knew it was an atomic ad. And it's going to memory location X. Okay, so the memory controller sees that. What, what must it do? Good. Let's, you know, with, with a lot of design decisions like this, there's a spectrum of solutions. Okay, let's take the simplest solution first. Simplest solution is, hey, we got this special kind of load. Nothing else can go. Okay, special load. Hey, I hope not to see too many of these. So let's, no other load is allowed, no other store is allowed, nothing is allowed. Let's finish this uh, atomic ad. So I load the value, I send it back to the SM, the SM updates it, it sends me a new value, I update it, okay, now everybody can go. It's like an emergency situation. It's like, well, does it work? Yeah, it seems to work. Is it good? Yeah, so all of a sudden now we're wondering, maybe that's gonna serialize things too much. Okay, so how do we make it better? I didn't get that. <laughs> I guess Siri doesn't know. How do we make it be better? But what is it that we really have to lock? What is it that we have to... Yeah. You just have to lock that one memory address? Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what you were getting at. We only really need to prevent updates to that memory address. So maybe we keep a little bit of a table. Okay, address X, currently locked. Nothing else, nope, you get a load from X, go away, or wait, you wait. Um, uh, okay, so at this point, only the ad, atomic ad can go. Once the atomic ad, we see the store for the atomic ad and we're sure that store is in the memory system, we clear that and at that point everything else can go. Right? Yeah, maybe that's a better way to do it. Okay? At least we've got some template in our minds about how this thing works. Okay, make sense? Any questions about atomic ad at this point? Okay, well, let's build on it. Um, okay, here, that's what I want. So now we, I, I've given you atomic ad. And now the question is, how do I build the sync threads? By the way, I should mention something. I didn't, I glanced over it.
when we do an atomic add, this address can be an address in global memory, meaning it's in the DRAM, or it can be an address in shared memory, meaning it's a block private memory location. Okay, so I pick and the atomic head either happens as we just described at the memory controller or it happens in the thing that's controlling the shared memory in the SM. Okay, let me go to my question then. How do we build sync threads for a block? Right, think about it, right? Um, I think everybody in this room, if you're paying attention, should be able to do this. And the hint is, yeah, you use atomic, yeah, atomic add. Hang on, hang on. Let's give everybody a chance to just get there. Raise your hand. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so if we were gonna write that as code, which he described, I think, perfectly, uh, kind of what I would do, something like this. If I'm just gonna use TX for thread, uh, thread ID. Have some flag, we'll set it to zero. Okay. Actually, I don't, we don't even need to do that. Let me, let me just do this. So we'll set flag equal to zero. Doesn't matter if all the threads do it. Um, then add one to the flag, all the threads. Actually, sorry, I'm kind of doing this in real time. So atomic add will return the updated value or the old value. I can't remember. Let's say it's the old value. Yeah, old value. All right, let me let me not do that. Sorry. Something like that. It's much harder to write code on the board than I remembered. Okay, so essentially while flag is less than threads, number of threads, we're gonna spin in that loop. Okay, so, and that's it. That is that is a sync threads. Except flag will have to be a shared, uh, will, will, would need to be in shared memory, right? Because we'll keep it in shared memory so we don't have to go all the way out to the DRAM for that for that particular value. Yes. Are uh, things like instruction burden implicitly by flag volatile? Yeah, I need to be careful about how I declared flag. Yes. Uh, and you're saying that because if it's non-volatile, then the compiler would just like. Uh... Yes. 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 So we. I'm not sure if we need to do anything 
for that or if that's going to happen automatically for us. It's, I'm not sure. Yes. question okay so how will that atomic at work within a within a warp and outside of a warp okay let's consider within well, let's consider outside of the warp first two threads two different warps thread one does the atomic add first thread two does the atomic add whenever and it's independent right so that case is easy I think you're asking about when they're together in the same warp. How does that atomic add work? Okay, remember, it's a single instruction, ultimately. Okay, so all the threads in the warp execute that single instruction. But remember what we just said, right? Well, they can't execute that single instruction at the same time because, well, it's a many-cycle instruction, first of all, because it has to go to the memory, update the memory, da, 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 and only one at a time. So none of the threads in the warp can finish the atomic add until they all finish the atomic add. And they all have to finish the atomic add sequentially. The atomic add is like a sync threads, effectively. Well, it's like every other instruction. They're all implicitly sync threads in a warp. Make sense? And then they all execute the while loop. And what are they waiting for? They're waiting for all the other warps to finish doing the atomic add. Okay. Now, if we're doing sync threads in a block, we really don't want to go all the way to memory for that, right? We can use the shared memory because it's much closer and it works for a block. So indeed, we would have made sure that flag ended up in shared memory. Okay, now, what about this? Sync threads for the entire grid. Why is that a bad idea? How would we do sync threads for the entire grid, first of all, and then we could come to why it's a bad idea? Uh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So changing it to work is not that hard. Why is it a bad idea? Yeah. Good, so it decreases parallelism, but even worse. What's worse? Yeah, that, right, right back there, yeah. No, no, you, sorry, I don't know your name. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so is it because we're using global memory now, which is what takes longer access time than shared memory, plus more threads, as you said? Yeah, I think that's a variation of what he said, but it's, there's something far worse. Not quite as worse as your GPU will catch on fire, but close. Yeah? What do you mean? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So it's not even that we're, the, the performance is lousy. In fact, there's no performance, it's deadlocked. 
right? And his, just to re-articulate what he said is, imagine we've got a million thread blocks and we've got a hundred SMs that are able to execute one block per SM for the moment, right? Hypothetical. Those 100 SMs run, they essentially hit the sync threads and then they execute the while loop. They're running, but they're doing nothing. All the million minus 100 blocks can't execute because there's no more resources left. We'll never finish, deadlock, or live lock, whatever you want to call it. Make sense? So yeah, this doesn't, this doesn't work. Um, let me throw another question at you. Let's say we wanted to create a piece of code that we're gonna call a critical section, okay? And this critical section can only have one thread executing it, executing in it at a time. It's kind of like the atomic ad, except it's a longer piece of code. It may be a whole half of the kernel. And you may be asking yourself, well, why would I ever want such a thing? It turns out that for general purpose computing, we often need such things. Maybe we're updating a database and it's the, it's the seat reservation database. We only need to make sure, you know, we need to make sure only one person is actually buying the seat on the plane at that point in time. It's a critical section. How do we implement that if we wanted a critical section? on the GPU. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times if you're buying a ticket, there would be like Yeah. Can do something similar. Elaborate. elaborate, elaborate. Let's break it down into a GPU language. Like what do we need to do that? Yes. Good, so you've, you've solved a specific instance where what you're saying is we're giving access to the critical section based on incrementally thread ID. First thread zero, then thread one, then thread two. Good, but now let's say we don't know the order in which the threads are coming. How do we deal with that? Yeah. Good, and we would use atomic add and atomic decrement to modify the flag up and down. Wonderful, okay. So his point is, let's create a flag, and any time a thread wants to enter the critical section, that flag must be a zero. So it tests the flag to see if it's zero. Well, if it's zero, then it increments it. Now remember, we've got warps. And the warps are all gonna increment it, thinking they've all incremented it because they all saw it to be zero, right? So yes, in fact, if you think hard enough, you can make it work with atomic add, I think. But what the CUDA designers have provided is something called a compare and swap, okay? and. I'm, I, I think, I'm going to 
take it back. I, I hope you can use compare and swap to, to address the issue that we just talked about. But here, let's, here's how compare and swap works. Okay, it's an atomic operation. I go to some address, flag, and I want to compare it to some value, compare. Okay, so if we look at old, which is the value at, the, at that address, if it equals compare, then we update it to this new value, and we return the old. Okay, and um, I do believe only one thread gets to do the update. I think only one thread gets the old value. All the, all the other threads get the new value. Okay, so meaning we, I think we have to ensure that the compare and swap only works on one thread at a time. Okay, so, but once we have that, then we can use your algorithm uh, to ensure that only one thread enters the critical section at a time. Okay, all right, so here we are. Um, I'm glad that we went through that in that much detail because it's, it's good for you to know these things. What we have is two primitives, atomic add, atomic compare and swap, and with that we can pretty much do what we want from a multi-programming and multi-threaded perspective. Okay, so let's put that aside for the moment and let's talk about histogramming because we're gonna end up using uh, atomic add for histogramming. Um, and the idea of histogramming, let me, let me emphasize the importance of histogramming. It's an operation that you just don't realize how often it happens. You know, literally, when you take a picture on your smartphone, dozens of histograms are created to balance out the brightness, to balance out the color, to balance out the saturation. Right? It's a common statistical thing. It happens in high-performance computing, in, in um, 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 computational molecular dynamics. It happens all the time in places you don't even think. All right. And oftentimes, it's happening on large amounts of data, uh, you know, billions of data elements. In fact, um, uh, I, I was involved on a project over the last few years, um, radar simulation, that you know quite well, uh, where we were doing a lot of complex stuff that needed to be done extremely fast around uh, automotive radar technology. Yeah, there's computational electromagnetics happening, there's 3D texturing happening, there's this happening, there's that happening. But the thing that limited us in terms of performance, the thing where everything just ground to a halt, was histogramming, or is still histogramming. Uh, because we're trying to do millions of rays from hundreds of antennas, you know, in as fast as possible. And as you'll see, it turns out that it's not easy to do fast, as simple as it is, okay? We all know what a histogram is. So let's go through a quick example. And let's say what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the frequency of letters in some English language text. Like we're just crawling the internet. We're trying to figure out, hey, what's the frequency of various letters? So we've got billions of characters, maybe trillions of characters out there on the internet. And we're just gonna build a histogram. So let's say we start with massively parallel processors. That's the first piece of text that we're going to histogram. Okay, so and we're going to use CUDA to do this, right? Of course we are. So we've got our text. 
And there's much more to it, right? It's just not these letters, but there's a lot of letters. What we decide is, okay, hey, thread zero, you're gonna get a chunk of letters. Thread one, you get a chunk, and thread two and three and four and so on. Okay, so in the first pass of the loop, thread zero reads the P, thread one reads the M, thread two reads the other M, and so on. Just give each thread a chunk of the input. So thread zero takes the P, and it goes over to the bin that corresponds to P, and increments it. Thread one goes to the bin that corresponds to M, increments it. Thread two, well, also goes to M. Now we hit that situation that we started the whole lecture off with, x equal x plus one. So we can't just do a simple update, as, as it should be clear to you. We have to use an atomic update because the updates are happening in parallel. Okay, and that makes this whole problem turn into something interesting. So now going back to one of the very first semesters we offered this course. Um, this was 2008. Okay, 2008, we offered this course. I taught this course. And I thought it was like 20 students in the course, not 300 like we have this semester. Um, yeah, kind of like this right here. Um, and a company called uh, KL KLA 10 Core, which no one here has ever heard of, I'm sure. But they make the equipment that's essentially in the clean room there. They make some of that equipment. Okay, so it's a, it's a big company, makes sophisticated equipment. And they said, hey, you know, you guys are learning this stuff called CUDA, which we're very interested in because we make th that stuff there, which you don't know it, but we want to put some GPUs in there because, you know, what we do, what KLA does, is we do this particular step in the processing and we sell this box and wafers go in and wafers come out and something happens in that step. Um, and we wanna put GPUs here because what we do is wafer inspection. Okay, we're gonna take pictures, ultra high resolution pictures of the, the wafer. And we're gonna find defects. And we'll tell you where the defects are. So, you know, if there's a defect here, just don't process any further. Only focus on the areas of the wafer where there are no defects. We'll tell you that. That's what our box does. Okay. And they sell those box, boxes for you know, tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, so we'll put a few GPUs in there. What we need to do is we need to do a very fast hundreds of million data point histogram. And we need to do it as fast as possible because the faster we do it, the more wafers we can pass through. So class, 20 people, that's your semester long project. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was a, actually turned out to be a two dimensional histogram. Okay, that's what they were interested in. It was part of their processing. I don't remember exactly where it fit in. And we had so many creative solutions that semester. Um, and again, this was 2008, right? And you probably, I don't know, don't recall, but 2008 was the year that they gave out, or the iPad was introduced. Maybe it was 2009, I, I don't remember now. Oh yeah, 2010. Yeah, you're right, 2008, seven was the iPhone, so 2010 was the iPad. It was that first year, and the prize that they offered up for the winner of that competition was two things, a summer internship <laughs> and an iPad. And man, we had so much fun that semester. <laughs> anyway, the point is, histogramming is where it's at. Question. Why 
tells you essentially like the frequency of, let's say you're taking a picture of the wafer, it tells you the frequency of a certain like, how would that like localize? Like I said, I just don't recall how the histogram fit into their algorithmic pipeline. In fact, I'm not even sure they told us, right, because that was proprietary. So the abstraction was two-dimensional histogram. Here's some sample data. Go speed it up. Okay. Okay. All right, so yeah, you see where this is going, right? And coming back to our example, we're just incrementing threads. Uh, we're, we're, we're just incrementing bins based on what the threads are seeing. Okay, but the increments have to be um, atomic. Okay, any questions on that? In fact, if we write the CUDA code for this, it's super trivial. But the point to make is we, so the green stuff, if it's all the text on the internet, it's like trillions of characters. Reduced down to 30, 35 ish, depends on whether we're counting lowercase and uppercase, and punctuation, bins. Right? So the amount of contention we expect to see here is very, very high. Right? It's a lot of stuff going into a very small set of things. Yes? Let's come to it, right? So, okay, now a couple of things we can do better, right? First of all is when we do the, the assignment, we can try to be more conscientious of coalescing, right? Because it's a lot of input coming in, and if all the threads are spread out, then we have essentially divided our memory bandwidth by the number of threads. So what we need to do is kind of amalgamate across the input so that all the threads are reading in a coalesced fashion. Okay. And yeah, clearly we've got to do something about the atomic ads. So, uh, um, so th this is uh, the, the kernel and essentially what we're doing is kind of going through and creating a stride so that based on the number of threads in the thread block, we all are mapping the threads to be consecutive uh, in, in terms of how they access the buffer. Okay. And you notice the atomic ad there. Right? You can't get around it. We gotta use the atomic ad. Question. Let's say they're like all distinct characters. Yes. Yeah. So, the the, the performance of a of a histogram is really driven by the contention on the bins. If I have no contention, it's beautiful. But like I was saying, usually when we do a histogram, we have lots of input going to a small number of bins. By design, we will have contention. So you are kind of like limited by the mode. Yes, yes, you are exactly. Yes. Um, as we mentioned, is limited by contention. But uh, for each thread block, they put a buffer in shared memory and then it combines all the buffers at the end. Yeah, which is similar to what he was saying. Okay, but the idea. Let me just generalize it. What we can do is privatize the histogram. Okay, instead of having one global histogram <laughs> in global memory. Let's create one private histogram per thread block. Okay? So now the thread block is just updating shared memory, updating that histogram. <laughs> now, when the thread block is done, what do we do? Go ahead.
beautiful. So now what we end up doing is we end up reducing the amount of contention to the global histogram by a factor roughly equal to the number of blocks. That sounds like a win. So indeed, we're now in the territory of lab six. Okay, this is what you'll be doing. Unfortunately, there's no prize competition for lab six, so you know, you'll just have to be motivated on your own. But that's the idea. Okay. Um, I think that's really all I need to cover because we covered all of this uh, earlier. But perhaps let me put a finer point on it and then we can <coughs> call it done. Um, the performance of the histogram is driven by contention. And what that means is, imagine that we have all these atomic operations. And you know what we end up doing is, OK, we see the atomic operation. We end up loading a value from DRAM. The DRAM does the load. It sends the value back to the SM. The SM does the increment. And it sends the value back to global memory to be written into the DRAM. OK, that's the timeline. And that's going to be hundreds of cycles. So if it's hundreds of cycles, then what we're doing is essentially stacking these up into the most contended for bin. And that we cannot do any faster than that for a global implementation, right? It cannot, it cannot be faster. Um, yes? Yeah, uh, they don't have a coherent cache, but the, there is a single L2. So yes, there is a single L2. And what we can do is take advantage of the single L2 on the, on the entire chip for this. And, and for the, 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 chi the chips that have it, we get that advantage for free without doing anything. So yeah, just the last, um, last point here is we're limited by the throughput on the most highly contended bin. That's what this slide says. And a couple of hardware improvements. One is the L2 cache. Because there's one L2 cache on the chip, we don't have to actually go through to global memory. We just go to the L2 cache, okay? But the L2 cache, the hardware designers have to be very careful because we have to worry about all the corner cases where, you know, one, um, we do one um, atomic add, it evicts a value in the L2 cache and now we've got some corner cases. Anyway, we don't have to worry about those. The, the hardware designers do. What that does is it reduces the overall latency because we're just going to the cache and not to the DRAM. And then the last point is, and this is why privatization works, is well, it's even better to put the atomics in shared memory because the shared memory is even closer. Okay, so um, there we go. Question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now we're we're. This is where that particular KLA ten core competition became really interesting, right? Everybody was trying different variations like this to to find the sweet spot. Um, yeah. So if it works, and again, if the bins, if, if there's lots of bins then we may have issues, right? If there's a small number of bins, or we can partition the bins, yeah, maybe that works. Yes?
Yes. Yeah, so you'd have to kind of partition it smartly, I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, in order for the per thread partitioning privatization to work. Yes. Okay. Um, just one thought. I'm going to throw it out there. In fact, I was debating on whether to include the slide when I was putting the slides together this morning. But I'll throw it in there now. I took it out ultimately. Who's familiar with the 3D rendering pipeline? And it's okay if you're not, kind of. Okay, in the 3D rendering pipeline, what we're trying to do is we're trying to paint pixels, right? Okay, I've got this 3D world that I've described using abstract data structures. And at the other end of the 3D rendering pipeline, I've got a screen. And one more thing, I have a viewpoint. This is where the eye is looking at this 3D abstract world in data structures. I'm looking here. Here's what I found. Thank you. Here's where I'm looking. Draw this on the screen. So what we do is we end up taking all those triangles that correspond to this view, and we put them through the 3D rendering pipeline so that on the other end, pixels get drawn onto the screen. So now I'm going to be sending some pixels, triangles, I'm looking this way that correspond to this thing because, well, this thing is in the view along with all the triangles that are hidden by this thing, right? Because, well, I don't know. I don't know that they're hidden. Anyway, and that's what the 3D rendering pipeline is. It just take all those triangles and we let the 3D rendering pipeline figure out how to convert them into pixels. Clearly, some pixels are going to be obscured by others. Okay. And the magic of the 3D rendering pipeline is that, like, at the very end over here by the screen is the Z-test. Okay. And what the Z-test is doing is it's saying, hey, is this triangle that I'm trying to draw the... the, the triangle that's closest to the eye or is it hidden behind something and only if it's closest to the eye am I going to draw it but I don't know which one is closest I, as I see them I have to do it anyway in the 3D graphics pipeline that's you know part of NVIDIA's bread and butter there is a test that happens and that's the z-test and it's actually a hardware accelerated test that actually is the same thing as an atomic ad. So there are ways to take the histogram operation and to speed it up by using things like a Z test. Because ultimately, what am I doing? I'm taking a value and I'm just going to try to update memory. Do I really need to bring it all the way back to the SM? Do I care that it's coming back to the SM? Why not just update memory at that point and be done with it? So why did I say that? Because I want to just seed in your mind that there's more innovation to be done here, right? Somebody's going to figure this out and do it and implement it and solve histogramming uh, in, a, in a major way. Probably NVIDIA, unfortunately, or fortunately. Okay, any questions? Well, I feel like we covered a lot of ground in this lecture, and uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys do in Lab 6. Okay, so let's meet on Thursday, and uh, yeah, thanks.
Hello, hello, testing, testing.